Okay, shall we start? Uh, so, uh, just a reminder, uh, Thursday is the first of the presentation days. So, uh, we have five presentations. Uh, I think most people acknowledged, but I'm hoping the others are, those who didn't are still in the class. Um, to submit, uh, log on to Great Scope, but you need to log in using um, uh, the school sign on option that they offer. So, in case, just in case you have a separate personal account from some previous course. Um, uh, so, basically, yeah, it, since I have synced it with the registrar uh, list, so uh, you should have access to the course. And there was a question about what did I mean by merging the PDFs? I should have said concatenating. So most of you will have two paper reviews. So you will have two PDF decks. Just concatenate them and uh, then upload. And after you have uploaded uh, in Grace Scope, uh, those of you, uh, many of you may have used it already, but in case not, you'll see options for the five paper reviews. So you need to just demarcate which pages correspond to which paper. So like let's say you're assigned paper number two and three, uh, two and four, let's say. So then you will mark some for two and some for four and skip the rest. So just make sure to do that. That will simplify um, as I look through them. Uh, in case you still have any questions about great scope, uh, you said just uh, drop a note on Piazza. Okay, so uh, last time around, uh, we had looked at um, uh, site channel attacks. Um, any of you attended the talk yesterday and faculty candidate? There's a pretty interesting talk where kind of he was using this whole uh, examining uh, site channel emissions from a embedded system for kind of a complementary purpose. So sort of so so two ways his talk was different. So firstly. Um, uh, I've been talking primarily in terms of uh, uh, looking at how the current being consumed by the device or power being consumed changes. In his case, what he was doing was uh, uh, he was looking at uh, electromagnetic emissions. And kind of the idea is that um, as um, so as, as the power uh, consumption happens, one of the effects of that is that there is a envelope, uh, effectively the clock signal gets impacted. So if you if you're drawing, um, uh, as the power consumption changes, kind of the voltage transients happen, they in turn cause the uh, amplitude of the clock signal to change. So essentially now what you have is um, amplitude modulated clock, where the amplitude signifies the work being done, the instructions being executed, and uh, essentially your system kind of literally transmits that RF signal, and then using an antenna you can nearby you can kind of pick it up. So, so that's one thing that he was doing. So instead of monitoring current consumption directly, uh, he would uh, he's monitoring the emissions that are happening because the clock signal is getting um, uh, is, is getting modulated. And the other thing was a purpose. So uh, instead of uh, kind of uh, the way I've been presenting, which is to extract some secret information, in his case, the purpose is our own device. And we want to know if a virus has infected it. So the idea being that, uh, let's say you are operating embedded systems uh, you have a factory that tons of embedded systems and you're kind of concerned about some malware which has crept in. And since these are simple uh, devices, so the software protections don't, don't tend to be very strong. So uh, the idea that his group, uh, he's from Georgia Tech, that he's been pursuing is that once a virus begins to run, then somehow the instruction sequence will change and therefore the emissions would have a different distribution in the frequency domain. So he basically takes a uh, frequency, uh, space time, uh, short time Fourier transforms, so essentially time versus spectrum, and then monitors that to detect for anomalies out there. So anyway, um, that's kind of an example of some these kind of techniques being used for a different purpose. I wanted to recap uh, what I had talked just uh, very briefly again for sake of uh, uh, I think I think I missed 
a couple of points so just wanted to go over so firstly uh, very broadly uh, the methods which analyze uh, these emissions fall into kind of couple of categories one is simply called simple power analysis and that basically refers to that by examining traces like these you and and, no, and of course knowing the program you can say something about what what is happening you kind of eyeball the data and from that you can begin to make some inferences so like in this case there were 10 rounds of aes uh, that happened and you can also begin to distinguish uh, between what different rounds may be doing so in this particular case it is for a decryption algorithm where they do some exponentiation function and deep down in the code of the exponential exponentiation function what they do is they look at the bits of d which is exponent and if d is 0 then they square a current value that they are maintaining and if d is 1 then they do a square and multiply okay so the idea is there is a loop and then within the loop there is a if a condition which is examining the ith bit so when you are in the ith iteration and then the and when you are going through the loop the uh, uh, you are doing uh, one or one of two different things and they have a very different signature so this is like the oscilloscope trace which uh, shows kind of uh, the first one is for a zero and the next pre previous one is for a one so you can kind of eyeball these things and kind of look at them um, a more sophisticated class of methods are the so-called differential power analysis and really what they re, uh, refer to is that instead of simply eyeballing and kind of looking at the features and all you begin to employ essentially statistical methods machine learning methods or uh, very commonly kind of correlation analysis so um, the idea being let's say you have some piece of computation uh, then and you have some secret uh, so uh, some secret value some variable so depending upon the value of that variable if you were to look at the power trace for that computation it will hopefully differ and the idea is that by looking at the power trace i want to infer what variable it was so let's say my secret is x i have the trace and this trace is function of x so given the trace i want to infer x this kind of as I emphasized last time, it's like a communication problem. I'm trying given a waveform I have received, I want to infer what was what was being sent, uh, and in this case, the secret. So, uh, so, uh, so much like in communication, oftentimes when we try to figure out whether this waveform that we got is for a zero or a one, we compare it against which waveform is it closest to. So we can train a classifier on we would send 0 look at what waveforms we got we will send 1 we'll see what waveform we got and then given an unknown waveform we will compare it against our library of waveforms of zeros and ones and whichever it is closest to kind of in, uh, very intuitively so uh, so that's uh, uh, that kind of analysis uh, one can do now in the example of 0 and 1 they are just 2 bits so basically they are 2 waveforms uh, even if you have a, a multi valued communication system typically you will have maybe 16 or 32 or maybe 64 kind of small number of distinct possibilities right corresponding to the few bits that you may have in a symbol but now imagine it is a key a secret key x which is in case of AES or these kind of things is like lots of bits 128 or 256 so i have 2 to the power 128 different possibilities and that many different waveforms so essentially i can't really do it um, uh, um, by literally kind of having a corpus of all those waveforms and finding the nearest match so that's out of question that's one thing the other thing is um, uh, how do I? Uh, I mean, when I'm when I'm sampling these things over the course of a program. So typically, your um, kind of a program might take uh, like these routines might take a whole bunch of number of clock cycles. And when you are sampling this using some A2D converter, you're probably sampling it a few times the clock just to get at least one sample per clock. Usually, a few more. So you have lots of samples also. So uh, so, 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 so we are facing two problems: long waveforms, and uh, and also lots of waveforms. So, uh, so there are few, uh, and and but loosely speaking, what we want to do is we want to find given a waveform which one is the closest to. 
uh, which one is it the closest to okay so how do we go around doing this so i uh, so one thing we do is the following instead of examining the, uh, so now at this point i'm kind of just getting into kind of practical techniques okay so so one of the things you can do is so uh, what what you are seeing here uh, just let me explain this thing uh, there are actually a whole bunch of different waveforms of different colors hopefully you can make them out but this is the pdf you would be able to so this is a time dimension. So this is an entire waveform. Think of it, the run of the program, and this is a power dimension. And you can think of these integers indicating the instructions or the clock cycles. Uh, so for different data values, uh, we have slightly <coughs> different waveforms. And so kind of the idea is that not every stage of the program is equally sensitive to the secret, but uh, perhaps some particular instructions is because that's where um, uh, that's where uh, maybe I'm doing some operation where kind of those bits matter the most. So what we can do is instead of like really comparing this whole waveform by, by running it on a bunch of different samples, let's say a bunch of different values of my secret, I can identify where the variation is the most. Okay, so in this particular case, the sample number 45 is not because that one has the most spread. So the idea is that wherever I have the most spread, is perhaps most uh, sensitive to the secret value. So I can kind of just focus on that. If you want a little bit more robustness, maybe you can pick two or three such top things. Think of them in machine learning terms. They are like your features, right? That's where I have the maximum sensitivity. On the other hand, like if I were to take something around here, 25, then there is not much discriminatory uh, capability there. So this is a kind of a cheap way of kind of identifying uh, what to do in this particular case we are saying my uh, time instants are the uh, features and I'm just going to focus on that uh, instruction or that sample number where there exists most sensitivity okay so so that's that's how we kind of handle not having to deal with a whole bunch of samples we still have the problem that uh, I may have way too many different waveforms right so 2 to the power 128 or even higher so what can we do with that in these solutions? Like I have a key of 128 bits, and if I were to simply look at, uh, think in terms of I have that many uh, distinct values of the secret, and I'm, I'm going to find the nearest waveform that obviously is not scalable. So, can you think of somehow simplifying this problem? So. Uh, so if, 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 if you think about like what happens typically under the hood in these encryption algorithms, it's not as if they process the entire 128 bit number as in one go. Usually these are iterative algorithms which uh, pick a byte, uh, work on it, then pick the next byte, work on it, and so on and so forth. So the idea is that you find that portion of the program where uh, you are handling some sub key if you may or sub secret okay and hopefully that's so, so now you have a small enough uh, distinct set of uh, a small enough set of distinct values and now you can play your correlation games and all okay so essentially at that stage I can um, identify and then you kind of do it for different uh, portions of the key and the way you do different portions of the key is by kind of examining where where in the program you are kind of in these different distinct phases. So knowledge, uh, knowledge of the program or knowledge of the algorithm combined with these kind of tricks is what makes uh, things scale. <coughs> Excuse me. What you are seeing out here is that now we are looking at that particular sample, the sample number 45, the one which was most discriminatory. And what we are seeing out here is what was the power consumption at that sample number 45 for different values of some intermediate variable that is being processed at that time, at that instruction. So there's some intermediate variable in the program. Um, and that intermediate variable obviously is a function of my secret. Uh, otherwise, I will not see this way. And, uh, and, and the point of this thing is the following, that there is kind of a structure to this thing. It's not as if power consumption is uh, kind of totally uh, random with respect to that value. In this case, you can see 
uh, kind of as the value increases and goes down, reset goes down, so there is some sort of a pattern. And what this is suggesting is that the actual power model that is being followed by the system is perhaps uh, something much simpler uh, here. That is, it is dependent on the value of x and it's some sort of a simple function of the value of x. So, uh, so when I talked about that how uh, we can, uh, instead of worrying about a complicated model of the whole processor and all, we can really think of that my power is power as a function of my secret follows some simple model. Uh, this is kind of an example of that, that some low order model typically works out and uh, once you kind of learn it, then you can apply that model instead of thinking in terms of CMOS circuits and stuff like that. So for example, a lot of these encryption algorithms and all, they make use of things like XORs and all. And if you look at the power consumption of XOR, so if I have an XOR gate, uh, if I take two random variables, uh, if I'm doing the XOR, then the number of bit flips uh, uh, is what is go, uh, dictates energy. So electronic circuits consume power only on those clock ticks when the value of uh, bit changes. If, if, if let's say I'm examining a wire and a clock tick happened, and at that wire I examined the value before and after the clock tick, if it were to be the same, then there is no no charge which had, which would have moved and therefore no energy, going back to your physics, no energy would have been consumed. So power gets consumed when there is a change in bit flip. Uh, so the kind of an XOR and all that basically translates into, you can look at how many ones exist or what's in, uh, or in particular in an XOR gate, if I have two inputs, I can examine how many different places they differ. And that's like the Hamming distance between the two. So that's why one of the models that I had mentioned last time was like a Hamming distance. So given the nature of an algorithm, you can hopefully come up with a simpler uh, first or kind of simpler power model in terms of some intermediate variable which in turn is a function of your secret. So all of this requires a little bit of uh, kind of playing both sides. You can't simply basically you know, um, uh, run uh, for a different number of a different uh, some, some random set of values of your secret and hope to find a good detector because the space is way too large. So you kind of approach it by simplifying the problem, by focusing on a smaller set of features, and by having a simpler model. So, so that's uh, that's how you kind of deal with uh, these things. And I guess the other thing I had covered last time was uh, towards the end was that different approaches uh, of hiding this thing. So sorry for a moment. So uh, so essentially, uh, uh, you attempt to hide this thing, uh, this is a wrong slide, you attempt to hide this thing by trying to make things, uh, one, one approach is trying to make things constant time so that independent of uh, uh, the value of the secrets, things don't change. Now with power analysis, things get trickier. Not only do I want to make sure that it takes constant time, I also want to make sure that the profile is exactly the same so that if I were to look at traces, at no point would there be anything where any any anything which gives away stuff, so that's um, uh, so so since to the first order, um, uh, a lot of these things do depend upon what's happening deep at the hardware level. So there are these circuit techniques which make sure that, irrespective of uh, what the value is at the input of a gate, uh, the number of um, bit flips that will happen will remain kind of the same and it will take the same time. So you try to kind of come up with things which uh, look the same. The other approach is go exactly the opposite, uh, randomize things so that even when I have a single specific value of x on different runs, I'm going to face a diff entirely different waveform. So I essentially seek to confuse um, the detector by uh, moving things around uh, based upon some additional secret, which of course I know, uh, but not otherwise. So this is uh, so example. In this case, could be if my program has a bunch of different pieces, which could be done in any order. Maybe at different times I shuffle them, uh, and then at the output I can undo undo that effect. So making things 
constant so that they are independent of x or making things random so that for the same x I have a whole spread okay and, uh, and these are kind of loosely speaking two different ways to deal with this thing. Okay, so uh, and as I mentioned the speaker the, who gave the talk in the EC seminar yesterday kind of is exploiting this thing for a very different purpose which is uh, to see whether a system has been compromised loosely speaking uh, essentially if my computer is doing some different computation then the signature will change and in that case I am really looking for a difference between um, what is normal versus what is different uh, abnormal behavior. In a way it is an easier task because uh, here we are trying to find specific values of a multi valued secret bit and whereas in that case they are basically trying to detect has the code been changed am I uh, is, is this IoT device one which I can still keep trusting. Uh, so any but um, as an adversary if you are trying to modify uh, or attack a, a device like this in the presence of their systems your goal would be to do your whatever attack with in a manner that they cannot detect it right. So, the roles are reversed now. So, in that case for example, you might want to make sure number of instructions in the loop do not change even though you are able to mount your attack. So, kind of the adversarial mindset would be can I do it without being detected with an approach like this. And of course, nowadays people are employing all sort of um, sort of ad more advanced machine learning methods as opposed to simple template matching and these kind of things. So, I have seen some papers where of course, neural networks and these kind of things are being used. So, um, so that is quite quite the rage nowadays. Okay. So, what this is uh, this represents is what are uh, as I earlier called hardware uh, side channels because the hardware is unintentionally emitting uh, some information. Um, sometimes these side channels are also used for deliberate communication to overcome an air gapped computer. So, the idea being that I may have taken all sort of care, uh, made sure that this device is which is controlling some important asset is not on the network and stuff like that. But maybe the manufacturer um, inserted some malware. Uh, so, somehow the supply chain got compromised, but now the manufacturer is faced with the issue that how can they extract the information when it is running. So, now you can imagine again this kind of an approach could be used to jump that air gap uh, by essentially using um, power or RF emissions or what not as a way to extract extract information. So, that is I guess the third use case extracting information from an air gapped computer. Okay, so, these are all hardware channels. Um, the, the other type of side channel which is the next set of slides I want to focus on are called as micro architectural side channels. So, now uh, this is all about within the computer. Uh, what does micro architecture mean anyone? What is the difference between architecture and micro architecture? Is not the micro architecture the one of the processor? Yeah, micro architecture is for the processor, but architecture is also for processors. So, uh, in context of processors what is the difference? It's the implementation. Yeah, it is the implementation exactly. So, uh, so the distinction is between architecture is usually mm, or the full thing is instruction set architecture. So, when you look for the Intel processor, Intel has this thick book which describes what are the um, what registers exist in the processor and uh, what are the instruction set and all. Uh, but of course, that 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 description of Intel processors applies to so many different processors of very different performance and power consumption that Intel makes. So, those processors differ in their details like they may have different sizes of cache, they may have different degree of parallelism, different depth of pipelining all, all sort of details may differ even though they all from a assembly language program perspective are identical. They provide same functionality, they have the same set of uh, the registers, same instructions 
uh, and stuff like that. So microarchitecture refers to the implementation of an architecture, okay, one level deeper, uh, implementation of a particular instruction set architecture. Okay, so uh, for the longest while, uh, if you have done computer architecture courses, um, they kind of the mindset basically was that um, instruction set architecture, that is the set of instructions a processor does, is kind of like the contract between the software and the hardware. So it's kind of two sides, kind of the computer engineers and electrical engineers on one side, and kind of the computer scientists on the other side, and the boundary is this ISA. And at least the belief was that other than speed and power, uh, the different microarchitectures have no implication on the correctness of the computation or things like security and all. They basically did exactly the same functionality. And then I guess in recent years, there were some kind of inc inklings that it might not be the case uh, because what is this microarchitecture, right? I mean, these different implementations, they are all sort of hidden registers and flip flops that exist in the implementation. So, there is stuff there in addition to what you see through your instruction instruction set architecture. So, besides the R1, R2, these registers that you can or in case of Intel architectures sort of A, B, C, th these different registers which you can manipulate and all there are all sort of other stuff which exist and of course, there is cache and uh, you have various kind of uh, predictors and things like that and all which, which, which there is all this sort of state that exist in the hardware. And people began to think that, hey, maybe when a program runs, it may leave its fingerprints in that hidden, in all those hidden stuff. And then maybe a different program can see it or exploit it in some manner, okay. So kind of things began to emerge. And then early 2018, late 2017, um, couple of, uh, so kind of a bunch of different teams, um, Europe based, Google um, and here and all, they kind of almost simultaneously identified um, a couple of uh, vulnerabilities which uh, existed basically in all the processors ever made, okay. All, all the processors of let us say desktop, server, laptop class things ever made. Um, since um, these things were pretty serious, so uh, kind of uh, the, there was a period where kind of the operating system vendors and uh, Intel and AMD and ARM and all they kind of rushed to patch and fix and all. Not all these things were fixable, some of them still aren't, uh, some of them were fixable with a lot of performance penalty. In any case, um, it was uh, made public early 2018 after kind of a short amount of gap. But that is not the end of it, um, a whole bunch of similar vulnerabilities. Almost every time nowadays a security conference happens, there is yet another vulnerability in the same family which emerges. And uh, uh, th th so, so essentially kind of it uh, shook this basic assumption that I can as a, as someone who is working at the higher layers of the software, we can basically assume that ISA, the instruction set description is a sufficient description and that nothing else matters, um, that is best left to the people who are working at the gate and circuit and micro architecture level. And I guess even now uh, kind of there are no good solutions to all of these things and in fact even the problem of like when you are designing these things like are you actually leaking a secret when your system runs? Will it leak a secret? Even those problems are all kind of op very hard to understand right now. So very active area of research uh, at present, uh, but I am going to describe both kind of general principles behind this and also uh, of this class of vulnerabilities and kind of attempt to give you some examples of this thing. Okay. So, what were the, uh, so, so these two attacks which were originally the first two of this kind, they were called Meltdown and Spectre and uh, like I said they were applicable to almost all the processors out there, there are some kind of minor exceptions here and there, but almost all. So, what was Meltdown? So, Meltdown 
um, uh, deals with uh, mel meltdown basically um, uh, tried to overcome this uh, thing which um, essentially an isolation that capability that modern processors provide. So, kind of one thing which we take for granted is that applications should not be able to affect the operating system. They should not be able to modify it. It should not be able to read any operating system uh, data structure or access any resource without the operating system's permission. So, OS can give permission and assuming the OS is bug free uh, with itself is kind of a big assumption, but let us assume that. Uh, it should not be possible that without uh, the OS giving the permission, um, a normal user space program is able to access any of these secrets or do any of these unauthorized actions. And the way we achieve this thing is, uh, we achieve this kind of separation is through uh, the fact that our processors or at least kind of let us say anything which is um, our smartphone or Raspberry Pi class and up, okay. Uh, they are designed by having uh, by, uh, by having conceptually a processor where there are two modes. There is a privileged mode and there is a user mode. And the idea is that uh, when you make like function calls and all, uh, you can do it within the user mode. But for you to call something, some instructions uh, and all that exist uh, or access something inside the operating system, there is only uh, a constrained way you can go to it. So, in effect a code which is in the privileged mode can always change mode to the user mode, but a code which is in user mode cannot arbitrarily switch to the privileged mode. It can only do what are called as system calls. So, anyone what happens in a system call? Right. So, yeah. So, so remember. So we are sitting in the user mode. Uh, good explanation. So I'm going to just expand on it. So uh, we're sitting in the user mode. Uh, we're not allowed to call anything in the privileged mode. So I can't simply do a function call. I can't simply read and write to those addresses and stuff like that, right? I can't do that. And in fact, there are also instructions I can't execute which because the only the OS is allowed to execute them. For example, on Intel processors, IO instructions can only be done by if you're in the privileged mode. So the only thing is, so, so there's a very stylized way that you get into, uh, uh, into the privileged mode and that is through what are called as traps or software traps. Think of them as interrupts that happen within the software world. So, uh, one way we know of traps is when your program does something illegal like divide by 0 or stuff like that. Okay, So, those are some examples of traps uh, or memory corruption, you attempt to read memory and memory is bad, so th th those, those kind of things. But then system call is a deliberate way. There is an instruction um, uh, which is basically a soft software interrupt thing. So, when that instruction is called, then basically uh, you, you can you can think of it as a interrupt gets generated and prior to the user mode program running that instruction it will put the some necessary arguments uh, in in an area of the memory in some registers in some area of memory so essentially you can think of it like a soft a special type of function call although it's not that it's really an interrupt where accompanying the interrupt is a set of arguments and then the operating system gets this interrupt, it examines that those arguments and then it decides whether the program which called it, does it have the right privileges or to do so or not. So, almost everything that you see which involves some sort of a lower level manipulation like open a serial port, write to a file, uh, read from a socket only or change mode of a file, these kind of things, they are all um, you, you deal with the so-called libc, which is kind of the wrapper library that operating systems provide in Unix-like operating systems. But if you look at the libc code, somewhere down there, it will be making a call to uh, one of the system, uh, doing one of these system calls. So, system call is basically the only way you can call operating system services. And, uh, and if, if you, uh, uh, 
just type, uh, just uh, look for uh, system calls and let's say Linux man pages and all this kind of a list of sys calls. So when 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 the software interrupt happens, one of the argument is which sys call it is because there are a bunch of sys call. Like for example, there is one for opening uh, file in case of Linux. There is other for writing or uh, for different purposes. So you can think of software interrupt accompanying code which tells which service I want from the operating system and then a bunch of arguments um, like for example write this is a buffer and you write this thing to the uh, file for example. And then a correctly written OS before actually executing your request will examine whether you have the right privileges, whether the arguments are well formed and all those kind of things before it proceeds with this thing. So this is how modern processors provide uh, uh, this this ability. Now what does what did meltdown do? So essentially meltdown um, breaks down this isolation between that normally exists between application and kernel and it does so by something which uh, is really uh, which is exploiting that whole micro architectural state that I described in an accompanying race condition. Um, so it's kind of a form of a side channel attack and you'll see it happens in this case because um, uh, that key assumption that micro architecture doesn't matter is not true uh, because essentially you're running a program and it leaks some fingerprints and so it, it leaks behind some uh, changes in the micro architectural state and then later on your adversarial program can come in and somehow examine that change in the micro architecture state which it which we normally believe it shouldn't be able to uh, because micro architecture should not be visible uh, but we are able to and thereby we are able to s learn some secret about the other program okay so essentially we use this micro uh, this 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 stuff left behind in the micro architecture which was supposed to be non-readable, non-visible but people found ways to make it um, make it uh, make it make that change visible and then exploit it. And uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, so using this thing uh, applications can access kernel addresses because now we have uh, changed the uh, 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 they have overcome that isolation. Moreover, another interesting thing that exists in many operating systems is, uh, so uh, kind of stepping back, um, so in a computer system, every running process gets the illusion that it has the whole address space to itself. <coughs> and kind of the application code and all kind of reside in some areas of the memory and these are all kind of defined by conventions. And then there is an area of the memory, usually it's either at the very top or at the very bottom of the address space, which is where the operating system is mapped. So the copy of the code and the data structures that constitute the operating system, they are mapped to every process that is running, okay? Uh, and then elsewhere is the application code. But one of the additional thing that happens is, for sake of convenience and all, part of that address space in which the operating system is mapped. In many of these operating systems, there is an area where the entire physical memory is mapped into it. Okay, now the reason we are able to get away with it is, uh, get away with this is because our actual address space is huge, right? 128 bit or 64 bit. Physical memory is tiny. I mean, even a well-endowed computer nowadays will probably have, I don't know, a few hundred gigabyte at most. Most of our machines are a lot less, 32 gig or 16 gig, right? So physical memory is pretty tiny. And what they do is they map that entire physical memory into as part of the operating system space. So if I'm able to violate the isolation and therefore I have access to operating system addresses, then through that I can address the entire physical memory. And therefore I can access stuff belonging to other applications also. So essentially, meltdown can read the whole DRAM uh, through kind of this mechanism. You break the isolation, and then you read the 
part of the virtual address space where the physical memory is mapped, and now you have read the whole data. It affects all Intel processors, all AMD, as I understand, and some on. Uh, uh, and but the saving grace out here is it cannot be triggered remotely. Okay, so which kind of and these these things matter because if it was triggerable remotely, then you are open to things like through a JavaScript in your browser, you can attack the system and stuff like that. Okay, so that that was kind of one same saving grace. Spectre. Oh, by the way, I think one thing I forgot. Uh, very briefly, I'll expand on this thing later. Uh, it, it does what is called a cache side channel attack. So cache is one of the microarchitectural features, right? I mean, normally the only effect of cache your program should see is that your program runs faster or slower. Okay, nothing else. It shouldn't really let you do anything more. But we'll see that there are w ways in which you can exploit cache to do some nasty stuff. Okay, so the second attack was Spectre, and what Spectre does is the following. So in modern processors, there's something called branch prediction. Uh, branch prediction refers to the fact that whenever we hit a conditional statement, like if x greater than 30 or something like that, uh, then do this, else do that. So like there's a branch, and I have two possibilities. Now the problem is that branch uh, instruction, uh, because those, these processors are quite quite a bit pipelined, so if I were to wait uh, to, so to keep the pipeline full, normally we have a whole bunch of instructions in the pipeline. But the moment we face a branch, if I were to, until I finish the branch, I don't know which side I'm going to take. So what computer architects decided some time ago was they said, okay, fine, but you know, um, we're going to take a guess. And we'll go ahead and assume, uh, based upon our guessing mechanism, that this branch is more likely and I'm going to proceed down that path. And if it so happens I'm wrong, I'm going to undo that effect. So in effect, uh, uh, but if we are right, and if we are right more often than not, then I have gained in speed. I've lost in power, I've lost in complexity of the processor, but I've gained in speed. And since in a lot of these things, we do worry about speed quite a bit, so this, this was quite important, and particularly because pipelines are very, very, very deep. So what uh, happens is CPU speculates how uh, which, which side to take. And it is done by a little piece of hardware which is called the branch predictor, which basically based on history uh, and perhaps compiler hints and all, kind of figures out for a given jump, uh, given jump instruction, conditional jump instruction or conditional branch instruction, whether the branch will happen one way or the other. And in modern processors, often these things are kind of like little neural networks, okay, which are doing this task. So what this kind of attack does is it first mistrains by this branch predictor, okay? So that it kind of biases it by repeatedly exposing it one data one way, like repeatedly the program will kind of go left, left, left. So the branch predictor will think it will go left and kind of you just mistrain it. And then you exploit this capability so, um, so that you will cause it to take an incorrect jump now, remember I said if it takes an incurrent branch, it has to undo the effect. Now, when it, un when it does the undo, it only undoes the software visible stuff. So it will change the values of the registers in the instruction set that were changed. But it doesn't undo the effect in the microarchitecture. And that gets exploited. So we'll see how that is done. So essentially, Spectre gets a program to execute code which it should execute, okay? And again, it affects most processes. And this one can be triggered remotely through code in the browser, okay? So, so these were the two ones, and like I said, since then there are a whole bunch of things that have emerged which uh, are, um, uh, some of them patched, some of, some of the, some of the changes that have been proposed are pretty expensive uh, uh, at the hardware level, and in any case, doesn't they don't help 
existing processors out there. I mean, in future, um, as newer generation of processors come out, uh, they can get fixed. So a lot of them got kind of handled through operating system patches and all, and some of them are not without some significant penalty. Okay, so um, so so these were kind of two attacks. Now let's kind of go into what 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 happens under the hood. So there's a little bit of segue into some of the computer architecture principles I talked about because that's what modern processors are and uh, that's what these security attacks sort of exploit. So in a sense, when we uh, talk about architecture versus microarchitecture, by architecture we basically at some level you can say it's your instruction set and accompanying things like what are the registers, of course there's a program counter and, and sort of uh, different processors define different number of registers and a bunch of instruction sets around it. What details such as how many clock cycles it will take, stuff like that are viewed as uh, separate because any program written using this should result in the same value uh, irrespective any system with I have a bunch of programs like this should behave identically independent of the implementation details of the underlying processor. And by implementation, this is what we mean where you kind of have all the underlying details like how many instruction sets, uh, how, how many ALUs I have, how many floating point units, how deep my pipeline is, all those kind of stuff, how much cash I have, all those kind of things. And so uh, typically vendors have many, many different implementations of uh, the same ISA. So like Intel has the Xeon class processors versus their normal processors versus their Celeron processors, and right? they all are at very different points in this implementation space. Likewise, ARM has um, kind of A53 and A15 and kind of a whole bunch of implementations of their A-series architecture, and then in cases like Apple, they have their own realizations of the ARM ISA, so uh, just different microarchitectures. So that, as we discussed before, is kind of uh, a key distinction and you have multiple microarchitectures for the same, uh, same ISA. So ISA is the contract between hardware and software. Microarchitecture is an implementation of the ISA and the software is supposed to be immune to it. It's not supposed to know it, it's not supposed to exploit it and your system should run, run identically um, independent of which, which implementation you're running on. So examples include what values exist in the registers that the ISA manipulates, what values exist in the mem memory, whereas on the other hand we have micro architectural states and this is stuff like what is in the cache, <coughs> what is the state of the branch predictor, right? I mean even if the branch predictor is incorrect or gives different results on different implementations, my software will only see a performance difference. It should not, the va computed value and the computed architectural state would, should, be, should be the same. So, no, having said that, in reality, if you are into the business of extreme power sensitive computing or extreme high performance computing, then usually people do optimize the software for the particular microarchitecture. So for example, knowledge of how much cache you have, what type of cache it is and all, can help you design better data structures, lay them out properly in memory and so on and so forth. So it's useful for optimization, but it turns out it's also useful for the attackers, uh, and that's what these vulnerabilities have been around about. So, let's see how kind of can it can play out. So, let's look at cache. So, uh, so let's say uh, I have a very simple program, consists of two lines. Print f i uh, is the format string, and then I repeat the same thing. Okay, and we start out, there's nothing in the cache. So I execute the first instruction, the first one, it needs i, except i doesn't exist in the cache. So a request will go out to the main memory, a value will be returned, and then depending upon the type of cache you have and all, it will go to some particular place uh, in the cache, depends upon how much 
associativity set uh, kind of the details of the cache that exist next time i'll have a cache hit and uh, no dram access so what's happening is that if i were to be able to time the execution uh, if i were to measure the execution time of this one versus this one then obviously the first one will be slower and the second one will be faster okay now uh, so 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 clearly um, uh, metro architectural state namely whether i is in the cache or not matters and if i have the ability to measure the execution time out here then i can learn something about the state of the cache right so that so far so good so uh, yeah. okay so uh, so what happens now uh, so imagine i have on the same processor uh, yeah, i have an attacker program i have a victim program there is a cache and then this of course the dram that they share imagine now the following scenario uh, uh, that these two programs so where where exactly in the cache your data structure a specific data structure is mapped to depends upon the architecture of the cache and where where in physical memory you, you are kind of residing so let's say you are able to arrange things so that you have some variable you as the attacker has some variable which maps to the same part of the cache where some stuff from this victim does and that's easy to do i mean again the assumption out here is always going to be you know what the victim code is and all all and of course you know what the processor architecture is also that's that's easy to do okay now what the attacker will do is it will flush the cache now interesting so flush the cache basically means that we basically empty the cache and this thing is provided uh, as something that a user space program can do you don't need any special privilege for that uh, why do, why do you think that might be why why do we let normal programs flush the cache when you access the cache faster so the user program needs like access to the web Well, uh, not quite. So, okay, so the reason we typically do it is to get deterministic behavior, and often programs that are trying to measure things and all worst case delays and stuff like that, right? So they kind of reside on this thing. So, and it was never deemed harmful, right? Like, I mean, uh, it's not going to affect the correctness of anything. So, since it's not a dangerous functionality, other than it perhaps may indirectly affect other programs by having them slower, so it. We, uh, processors have always made it visible because there is utility uh, in a variety of scenarios. Okay, so the attacker flushes. Now it waits for the victim to access the cache. So it victim accesses some memory location, and then uh, and then uh, it accesses that uh, when when it, when it uh, accesses the value fetched from the memory and. It's And then later on, the attacker is going to access it, and uh, it will measure how long. The attacker can always measure how long it takes to access the cache. And depending, uh, and 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 from that measurement, it can now tell if the victim actually accessed the data or not. Right. So what the attacker has now learned is that since it flushed, did the victim access? This location or the corresponding location of memory or not, right? So we have learned that without actually uh, violating anything, right? I mean, it's just a side effect of the cache that we are seeing. Uh, of course, one thing you should probably ask is, can I measure such fast things? I'm talking about measuring like a single instruction or so. Turns out that's reasonably easy to do because modern processors, for a variety of other reasons, 
have some very good time measurement capability. There's an instruction in Intel processors which let you measure how many clock cycles have expired since have, have, have taken place since the process has started. So you can literally measure number of clock cycles. Okay, so that's measurement is not a problem. No, no, no. So we'll see how this plays out. But of course, I know that at victim code, I can arrange things that where. So what is the motive of attacker? Because we already know the data. And the no, it doesn't know data. Remember, I know the code. I know. I attacker is a normal user process, so it cannot examine its data structures. Right? It knows the code. It knows that data structure, whatever some particular class exists. It knows its layout, but it doesn't know on a particular run what the value was because that value may be something which is coming from a network packet or a user input, right? So it's a secret. Okay, so in this particular case, at least we know that uh, no. yeah, if the, by measuring the speed, I can know whether the victim accessed some particular thing or not. Okay. Uh, so that uh, leads to exploiting this cache as kind of like a covert channel to begin to uh, 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 do nasty stuff. So one threat scenario is I have a Trojan process and I have a spy process, and they can communicate via cache consoles. So oftentimes what happens is you may have two apps on your phone, and you they're from, uh, they're supposed to be what is called a sandbox. They're not supposed to talk to each other. But now they can talk to each other, right? They can actually cooperate uh, in this case. So you may download one app from one entity, and you know that app says, "Hey, you know, I'm perfectly kosher. Um, trust me, I don't send anything out. Okay, I will never talk to any other app or anything in the outside world. But using some method like this, uh, it can actually talk to another process, which." Uh, was genuine, with, to which you did give permission to talk to the outside world and all, because that was innocuous. It wasn't accessing any sensor data. So like uh, 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 Trojan may be, let's say, an app. It promises that it will monitor my, I don't know, my uh, heart rate and warn me whenever I'm at risk of something. But it's never talking to outside world, so I gave it the permission. And this program is some other program which provides me some other surveys, I don't know, maybe it's an email app or something which uh, has a genuine need and I gave it permission, but it doesn't have permission to those sensors. So I have this sort of comfortable feeling that my sensors are only being exposed to programs which don't have any, that we cannot talk to the outside world, and this one can talk to the outside world but doesn't have access to the sensitive data, but through the cache mechanism they can, and it's basically not something that you can detect very, uh, detect very easily uh, uh, or do anything about it. Okay. Uh, the, there are various attack techniques that get exploited, but one which is called is called prime and pro. So the idea is that the attacker will fill the cache with its own data in a selected manner. So it's going to flood the cache and then it's going to fill it in a particular manner. Then it's going to wait. And then it's going to probe. So it's going to scan through the cache, we'll see shortly, and, um, and measure the timing. And that way you can see what, what the victim did. So let's see how, uh, we'll, we'll see in a bit how it works out. So. There are many other attack scenarios you can imagine. Like for example, nowadays we often run things on the cloud. So these are shared machines. You may have a virtual machine or a uh, Docker container running on a machine and on the same machine is running some other service, which is maybe a competitor service, um, okay? And so now again, you uh, even though these VMs are kind of literally kind of entirely separate machines, entirely separate operating systems, but they're virtual machines. So they're kind of running on the same hardware, they share the same cache. So one of the ways you can, a VM can still leak information uh, is through the cache. 
Okay, so that's the uh, uh, that's the cache thing, uh, and uh, we'll build upon it later. Another concept is out of order execution. Uh, literally, as the name implies, uh, there are times at which the processor executes instructions not in the order they appear in your code, but in some different order. So, like for example, um, uh, a piece of code out here that says width equal to 10, height equal to 5, and then diagonal is square root of this square plus so height square, and area is width times height, and then you print up the width, height, and area. Okay, so uh, uh, so there are things here which have dependence. So clearly, I cannot print to this printf unless I have the width, height, and the area because this printf is all of them. On the other hand, these instructions can be done in parallel. Okay, uh, so certain things can happen together in whatever order, I can compute diagonal and area in whichever order I like, but I cannot do the printf uh, until I actually have the area, for example, to do the dependent function. Okay, so you can always analyze the program and kind of look at these, look at these dependencies. So what happens in out of order execution is that uh, somewhere in your microarchitecture, there is a unit which fetches the instruction set into a queue, right? So it goes sort of build a queue with kind of instructions that will have to be executed and uh, but then fetch from the main list. So instructions are fetched, they are decoded. So uh, kind of we expand it into the internal bits which control registers and arithmetic units and whatnot. Uh, uh, and then we put it into a queue. And then there is some other piece of hardware which looks at this queue and then takes the instruction and sends it out to the appropriate hardware. So, aha, this is a floating point add, let's send it to the floating point. And if this one is an integer multiplication, let's send it to the integer A and B, and so on. So Except it doesn't do it in a strict first in, first out manner. It kind of looks at the whole queue and says, you know, the front one I cannot run because I need it needs a value which still is not available, but the second one I can, so let me dispatch that. And that's what refers to out of order, that um, because I have multiple execution units in modern processors, so I don't have to wait just because the frontmost one cannot execute. I can, I can, I can move ahead to the next one as long as I'm sure that. Uh, uh, yeah, I would be able to yeah, do it. So, uh, so, um, so what's happening is with out of order, uh, instructions are executed out of order. Instructions have to wait until their dependencies are ready, right? So, if, and if an instruction needs some operands, if those operands are not available because they are being computed by instructions which have not yet finished. Then, uh, then they'll have to wait. So consequence of this is that if I want to look at the flow of my program, the kind of the order in which instructions occur in the program, then later instructions might execute before the earlier instructions. However, what I have to make sure is that instructions are retired, so to say, omitted in order. So the effect of all of this out of order at the end of the day it still has to be as if they had executed in the order that they should have. Okay, so if I were to examine the values of the registers after a block of instructions has executed, even with all this out of order stuff happening in the hardware, my values in the register should come out exactly the same, right? My com correctness of my computation, at least in terms of the values, should not be affected. So, uh, so, so instructions are, have to be retired or committed in order, and that at, and when an instruction is finalized, like when we say, okay, now like I'm done with it, at that point you can say it is visible to uh, 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 rest of the software. Okay, so uh, um, yeah. we'll see kind of this interplay of cache and. 
uh, out of order execution sort of play out a little bit. So the other thing is back to caches, uh, mod modern day uh, machines, I mean for a long while now, they have a whole hierarchy of caches, right? I mean there is some cache which is on chip, there is some cache which is off chip. Um, yeah, so. Uh, some cache which is just for each one of the cores and some cache which is shared among the cores. So this is an example where I have a whole bunch of cores, it's a quad core processor and nowadays like embedded processors and all have multi cores so it's not that unusual. Level 1 cache, level 2 cache, they are per processor, uh, uh, there is some sort of a bus and then uh, uh, you have uh, last level of cache which basically is a shared cache across all the cores. So on current Intel CPUs, just to give an idea, um, or on any CPU really, the first level cache would be slower than register. So when you access a register, it's like a single cycle, L1 cache, four cycles, L2 cache, 12 cycles, L3 cache, 25 to 30 or so cycles, DRAM, hundreds of cycles, okay. So it's basically the speed difference is what uh, drive this whole memory structure. So uh, the user programs, uh, particularly one which are performance sensitive, scientific computing, media processing, these kind of things, they do they, they they do a lot of cache optimization. So basically, what happens is that the compilers examine the code and then kind of insert cache uh, instructions that uh, manipulate the cache in some few cases. And there are a couple of uh, things. There is one which is prefetch, which basically essentially tells the CPU, go ahead and load some data into the cache because I know I'm going to use it. Okay, so so that without um, so, so essentially the program program uh, is hinting or telling some application specific knowledge so that by the time the program accesses it, the stuff is sitting in the CPU. So that DRAM access can take place in the background. And the flush, which we already talked about, it throws out data from all the caches. And, um, and, tip, and the, all of these caches and all are handled in terms of virtual addresses. So the applications operate in the virtual address space as opposed to physical addresses. So hopefully you have seen some of this stuff in some computer architecture course or the other. Um, so now, uh, um, uh, one of the other uh, ingredient is that we need to learn, uh, we need to figure out um, the timing, okay. So we need to have a timing model of the cache. So essentially on the machine what you do is you have to learn what a cache hit results in and what a cache miss would result in. And you time this thing many, many times uh, and kind of so just, just to kind of have a more robust estimator. So idea is you should be able to have a uh, simple classifier which says given that it took me so much time, was it a miss or a hit, okay, so kind of a very simple classifier. So so step one uh, to um, measure the cache hits, so we'll measure time and essentially read some sort of a timer, uh, access a variable, uh, uh, measure time, update the histogram. So do this in a loop, so you basically, for some particular variable, uh, you are essentially, after the first time, it would have been sitting in the cache, and therefore I'm just learning the cache hits. Whereas here, um, uh, you arrange it to be in a cache miss, and that you do so by a cache flush, and now again you are measuring. So you make two measurements on how much on this machine a cache miss would result in, in terms of timing, kind of histogram of that, and how much would a cache hit would result in, okay, and hopefully these two histograms are clearly separate so that you have a clear threshold based upon which you can do the differencing. How do we develop this? How do we have this timing thing? So this is where you are not going to use your get time of day and all, there is way too inaccurate and all. You have to work at the level of the hardware out here, okay. Uh, so it turns out, like for example, on the Intel processors, there is an instruction called RDTSC. Uh, uh, stands for read, timer, something, okay? And then you call your function and then you do another RDTSC. Uh, you, of course, the difference, okay? How can you call instructions from your, let's say, C code or C++ code or something like that? 
you ever tried it? Like, how do you? Uh, this is this is not a C function. This is literally an assembly code instruction. <coughs> so, have you? Yeah. Yeah. How do you do that? How many of you? So you seem to have done it. Anyone else have? You have, have you done it? Inline assembly? ASM. Huh? Yeah. yeah, ASM. So GCC allows it. Most compilers would have some 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 way of kind of doing it. So you can insert assembly instructions in the middle of your C, C++ code and all, okay? So, so that's how you do it. So this doesn't suggest by any means that you're writing all this stuff in assembly. You just put an assembly level instruction out there. And you have to, like these kind of instructions are pretty easy to insert. You can actually put arbitrary assembly instruction and if you're familiar with how the, com where is the compiler, where the compiler puts the data and all, you can be kind of smart about and do a lot of clever stuff, okay? So I can do accurate timing. Uh, 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 you have to be also sort of careful out here. There are a lot of um, uh, uh, things that may happen out here. Like for example, you do this RDTSC and then you do this function which has its own set of assembly things. But remember I also said that there is out of order execution. So is it truly happening that this thing is happening before this? Uh, there are all these kind of uncertainties that also kick in. So you have, so even this measurement process sounds simple, will will work if it was a strictly sequential processing of the instructions. But in reality, uh, there are complications even there. So when you are measuring stuff, there one has to be careful. So it turns out that there are ways that you could serialize instruction. You can basically put an instruction which basically says. Um, uh, make sure from this point uh, on that, that this instruction happens before the next one. So there is a serial uh, on, on, on some CPUs there is kind of an instruction which uh, does that serialization because RDTSC is used for time measurement purposes and if we were to not do anything special we may think we are measuring function but in reality maybe we are picking up other instructions also. So modern CPUs have special instruction to assist in that process also. Uh, there are other instructions also which help serialize. There is an instruction called CPU ID and so on and so forth. Okay. So, and Intel has this entire sort of, uh, 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 is, uh, sort of document describing how do you measure time precisely on this thing. Okay. So, we have figured that out. Let's say we are able to measure it. So, now we have the cache hit histogram, I have the cache miss histogram. There is probably going to be some overlap out here in our histogram, but I mean it seems like there is a peak around here, there is a peak around here, you make a measurement. Essentially you have like a noisy sensor, okay? And like with any noisy sensor, your friend is to average things out over multiple measurements, but seems reasonably well behaved. Okay, so I can measure, uh, now I have a classifier which given uh, uh, the access time to a memory location could tell me whether it was in the cache or not with some accuracy which seems pretty good. Okay, so now let's go back to how we begin to use these things. So back to our meltdown and spec. So uh, the general idea is that we are going to use uh, one of these performance features of the processor, out of order execution, predictive execution and all to essentially cause a change in the microarchitectural state and then we are going to measure it using the side channel we have. So these different attacks um, that existed and the, there were multiple versions of these things, uh, they exploit exceptions, they exploit conditional branches, they exploit indirect branches and a whole bunch of stuff and like I said since that original stuff around two years ago, there's an immense body of literature where kind of a whole bunch of other things people have identified. Okay, so let's see how it can work out. Uh, now, I guess uh, some of the details out here are also frankly beyond my sort of software, understanding of software also. So. I'm going to be glossing a little bit out here in certain things. Um, yeah, I mean, these are these are coming from people who are kind of really hardcore operating system uh, geeks. Okay, so pretty pretty uh, deep stuff. But at least hopefully I'll convey to you 
kind of what's happening at the hardware level, sufficient to understand what's what's happening, but the full detail of how the attack is mounted, I'm not going to go over. Okay, so let's look at out of order execution. So what's happening out here is that, so let's imagine I have this uh, quote sequence. So it says uh, uh, load register R2 uh, and the, uh, using R9S address. So the first instruction is taking the memory pointed by R9, loading it into R2. Next instruction says add R2 and R3 and puts it into R1. Third instruction says uh, add R1 and R5, put it into R4. So you can see third instruction needs R1, second instruction produces R1, so there is a dependency there. And the final instruction says add R6, R7, R8. Uh, so now there are dependencies between the first and the second, between second and the third, but the final instruction is independent of them. It's saying R6, uh, add R7 and R8 and put it into R6. So I could potentially execute it anywhere. I can execute it before the first one, between first and second, between second and third, or after third, okay? But the first, second, and third have to be uh, uh, done in order. So in particular, it may happen, uh, likely will happen, that uh, the instructions are coming, uh, the first one gets scheduled to R2 fetch the content from the address in R9, since it involves a memory fat fetch, it will probably take more time. So meanwhile, therefore, I can't proceed with the add instruction. So I will uh, add R1, add R2, R2 to R1. So I'm going to proceed with the add R7, R8, and putting it into R6 instruction. Okay. So this is where uh, out of order benefits us because I can keep the CPU busy. Okay. So uh, so that's the out of order. Okay. Uh, uh, one thing that we ex will also exploit out here is this notion of exceptions. So I talked earlier about traps, software interrupts. So, so essentially, you have software interrupts which are program generated through an instruction. You have hardware interrupts coming from outside, like um, external thing. But then uh, another source of interrupts, which I briefly alluded to, is um, uh, when some bad thing happened, like. Um, floating point exception or something like that. So exception is basically a general term which refers to when a CPU thinks something is wrong. Uh, and what happens when an exception uh, when an exception happens is that the CPU basically stops execution of the currently running code and then passes control to uh, handler function. Or something. And then typically uh, the OS will terminate the user program unless uh, um, there was some way of retrieving it. So for example, divide by zero or uh, accessing memory which doesn't belong to the processor. So like for example, if your code tries to access memory to which it doesn't have access to, like a kernel portion of the memory which is the, belongs to kernel. So like if you try to write access contents of memory location zero, so probably you will hit this track. So, so now how is that connected to out of order execution? Well, um, uh, remember, in out-of-order execution, um, we are executing an instruction which is farther down, right? But now let's imagine that I have executed that instruction which is farther down because instructions which were preceding it are still in either in the queue or being processed. And if one of those instructions results in an exception, Right? So again, some instruction farther down, I went ahead and executed it because of the out of order feature. And, and then one of the instructions which is earlier than this one in my ordering hits an exception. So, uh, uh, so the instructions um, uh, following this offending instruction have already been executed. Uh, uh, so we need to kind of do some uh, rollback out here, right? Because we don't want the effect, because those instructions should not have been executed, right? It stands to logic that if I have instructions A, B, C, if B causes exception, then C will never get executed. So I need to make sure before I go to the exception handler, um, I kind of undo this effect. Now, this is where the funny thing happens. 
the architecture of state is rolled back in the processor. So the processor say, great, I mean, this uh, exception happened, and of course, that instruction C in my example shouldn't have been executed, so I'm going to undo the effect of C. But when they say they will undo the effect of C, what they really mean is if C wrote into some register, they are going to undo that. But if C caused some microarchitectural state change, like for example, if C had resulted in a data being fetched into the cache, or if C had updated the branch predictor, that will not be changed. So what's happening now is that uh, that instruction C kind of which was optimistically executed should not have been executed. We undid its effect, which was visible to normal software, but we don't undo the effect, which is at the microarchitecture level, under the belief that that state doesn't really matter. It only affects the performance. But as we saw earlier, changes in the cache state can be used to leak information. So while it certainly doesn't affect the functionality, it's not causing information leakage. Uh, and now, why don't they unroll the microarchitectural state? Why do you think we don't? Why don't we unroll the state of the cache? Right, I mean, that will solve the problem, for example, right, so at least with a cache thing, let's say. They would kill performance. Um, no, no, so, so you could imagine that I could, uh, okay, so currently the only way of doing it is you're right, it will kill performance, I have to flush the cache. What I could do is I can keep track of every cache transaction that was taking place and then go and specifically undo them, but that will kill my hardware, I mean it would just be super expensive. So what has happened in the past two years, then I think we have had several faculty candidates in 2018, 19, and uh, who have kind of whose thesis are around this thing where people have basically been saying, can I design efficient caches which have that kind of unrolling capability? Okay. So you could do it that way, but you're absolutely right that currently the only way I can unroll the cache uh, is to basically flush it, but that will totally kill the performance. Okay. So uh, so register value is rolled back, but cache content changes are not rolled back and therefore uh, that optimistically executed instruction some we are learning something about it even though it shouldn't have been executed so so specifically let's say we want to know the index or offset of a data in an array which the victim has so let's say the victim process has an array and uh, uh, it has in some location some secret private data and I want to know which index it is at, okay, because then maybe that index can tell me something about what type of data it is and all, okay. So we will start with the assumption and again like I said uh, apparently, uh, I mean this is one of the places where I do not personally know how to do it, attacker and uh, we can arrange that attacker and victim can share the same physical page, okay. Then the idea is we are going to uh, flush the cache, uh, sorry, so flush the cache, so every, the cache is empty and therefore every uh, whatever set in the cache is going to be slow if we were to access it. Then the victim loads the data at offset 2, okay, so what will happen is that as a consequence, um, uh, that location become valid and therefore it becomes fast to access. Then the attacker will scan the whole probe array. Remember, attacker shares the physical page, so attacker essentially has ac the ability to uh, probe, uh, uh, probe the same set of addresses and it will find which cache line it is seeing a fast access at and therefore it can know the offset. So the victim process has this array, it puts the data in one of those locations and the secret here is where it put the data and uh, 
then the attacker scans through this array because it's mapped to the same cache line and therefore it can know where the victim put the data okay and kind of the idea is that uh, the index at which you are putting the data is a function of the secret value right i mean it could be i'm putting it based upon i don't know like uh, the height of something or speed of something uh, you can easily contrive or whatever construct scenarios where the secret is the place where you are putting that object in okay so uh, uh, so 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 the idea then becomes that somehow um, um, uh, we are going to um, uh, going back. So, somehow we have to kind of arrange this this stuff to be done. So uh, what what happens in this case is we are going to raise an exception. We are going to go ahead and access uh, 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 this data. So as you rem remember, when the exception is raised, not the entire state. Uh, changes are undone in particular the cache state I can arrange that the cache state changes are still visible so that's basically what we uh, these attacks seek to do which is um, an exception is raised so that the victim process is killed but the access patterns which it had done are kind of uh, are, are, are kind of left behind so the way to arrange this thing now is that somehow I have to get the victim process to get into a stage where uh, it raises the exception and that can happen because I can supply it input okay so a lot of times these are some process which have some user interaction or maybe they accept a net network packet or something and I can feed them values and all which can result in these kind of exceptions so you have to find not not every program obviously but programs which have inadequate checking of their input and all I can kind of cause these kind of behaviors once I have done that, uh, so so in this particular case, well, uh, basically, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so so what's happening out here is we do something which will result in a exception raising thing, and then uh, on the optimistic path, uh, out of order, some access to the probe is happening. Data is my secret, so uh, the location I'm accessing is a function of the data, and then uh, the attacker process will examine it. And when the attacker process will examine the whole probe array, it will see that at location 84, the time was very low. Okay, so basically, depending upon, uh, we, we are leaking the value of the data, okay, in this example. So once we have done that, so once we are able to, uh, yeah, do this then I can read into rest of the stuff now this is where another thing comes how do I raise the exception so one of the ways you can raise the exception is by accessing something illegal okay so the idea would be that this probe array could be something which is actually in the invalid areas of the memory so I actually shouldn't have executed uh, 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 this, this access shouldn't have been done but what will happen is that it will go ahead and update and then later on realize that you know there is an exception and then clean it up uh, but meanwhile the cache has, cache has been changed so using this I can attack the kernel memory so um, as I mentioned earlier in modern operating systems in the address space of the application there is a region where the entire OS is mapped and uh, usually a part of the hardware called memory management unit every time you do memory access it kind of checks are you allowed uh, is uh, are you allowed to access it or not and um, if any time you access the kernel memory uh, exception is triggered uh, so essentially uh, uh, in the in, 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 in the entire uh, The virtual address space of your process, uh, kernel is residing somewhere in the virtual address space, a particular page in the physical memory, which is mapped to the, uh, which belongs to you, let's say, it belongs out here, is also reflected back into a part of the kernel where the physical memory is mapped to. So 
the idea being that I can always coax an exception by deliberately trying to access an area of the kernel memory uh, by exploiting uh, this capability. So this is kind of the whole attack idea then, it's a very simple piece of proof of concept code that they had done. So there is RCX is some sort of a uh, 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 kernel address, RBX is a probe array and kind of the idea is that we try to do a move instruction from uh, an area which belongs to the kernel. So this instruction move A1 uh, byte move from address in RCX, this will cause an exception. But meanwhile, the other two instructions are independent of that. So it will kind of go ahead and move things in particular, uh, uh, this particular instruction, which is the probe array sort of code, uh, goes ahead and gets executed. And at some point, the processor realizes that, aha, I have an exception situation. So it undoes stuff, but meanwhile, this thing has already happened, and therefore, the cache has been updated. So that's kind of the sequence of events that they kind of arrange. So essentially, uh, we have an optimistic execution of the red instructions. Later on, the exception happens, and then there is a rollback of the optimistic execution, and but the cache state has changed, and therefore, uh, by side channel, we can kind of detect what is happening. So, this 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 is an extract of obviously you need all sort of other stuff around it to actually have an exploit, but basic vulnerability is along these lines. Okay, so uh, so when an exception happens, uh, it needs to be handled. Um, yeah, so the way um, yeah, it happens in Linux is the following: that we register a handler, and when you run a process for different kind of exceptions, there is a default set of handlers that the OS provides. Okay, and typically for things like uh, divide by zero and all that basically all that handler does is it's supposed to just kill the process print some message or kill the process but you could be clever uh, you, you yourself could seek to kind of handle those things themselves so like some sometimes maybe uh, your application wants to be more robust and says you know if it's a divide by zero I'm going to do something special about it like maybe um, uh, take some preventative action okay so uh, so so Linux, for example, provides a uh, very sort of handler. Uh, now, the way uh, uh, so 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 there are many different ways, kind of uh, one can one can do these things. Another one is that uh, you can create a clone of yourself, like a process can clone itself, uh, so that. Uh, even though the process where the exception happens dies, but you still get access to rest of the state. So there are a variety of ways you can kind of build around around this uh, concept. Once you are able to now access, using this mechanism, if you are able to access the kernel memory, then you can go even further, and now you can begin to read the part of the kernel memory where the entire physical memory is mapped. So when this paper was published, they had set up example code which basically systematically just dumped the entire data. Okay, so uh, can, uh, read as a normal process, you can now begin to read areas of the memory which you normally wouldn't have access to. Okay, so you can read the kernel, but not only the, and because you can read the kernel, you can kind of read the whole thing. So, so the idea would be in this particular case, going back out here, you will write an attacking code yourself, which will have this piece of thing, uh, this offending structure. You will raise an ex arrange to raise an exception by uh, accessing. Uh, 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 invalid location, a location in the kernel, you will arrange that you will fork just before the exception uh, uh, and uh, 
thereby kind of now you have a copy and you have arranged for uh, via this mechanism essentially gain access to uh, some value in the some value in the curve. So uh, that's kind of the basics, b b basic way sort of they kind of uh, arrange for doing this. Long story short, a process this way is able to dump. Uh, you can write a program using that code snippet whereby you can dump the entire DRAM and therefore you have access to now all the other uh, programs content. So like if you have a browser running, maybe somewhere the password is stored, stuff like that. So by then doing some analysis of dump, you can discover all sort of all sort of stuff. So uh, anyway, so this example shows that um, uh, if Firefox is running, then this password manager is storing password and all, and they are all getting leaked because you can using Meltdown, which could be run by a different user on that same machine. You can access all those things. So. Um, What are the uh, um, solutions out here? Yeah, what, what, what can we do? So one solution and which actually has existed for a whole bunch of different reasons anyway, and that's called kernel address space layout randomization. And kind of the idea is that every time the machine boots up, the kernel on that machine the data structures in it and all are laid out randomly. And the idea behind this is that there already exist a whole bunch of software attacks and all that happen. And the life of those attackers is simplified if every machine has the same layout. So this technique called kernel address space layout randomization uh, is used uh, quite a bit to essentially harden the thing so that the layout is different. So kind of the adversary has to try out more things. The only problem is that uh, the entropy in this, okay, the distinct number of options that you have is relatively low. So it turns out that with very few attempts, you can kind of overcome it. So this layout randomization is, uh, if you are going to use randomization as a strategy uh, in any different scenario, then you better have a lots of bits of randomization, okay? And uh, it's kind of like your key length, okay? So uh, it turns out that the implementations of this methods in the operating system don't have that much randomization. Uh, another uh, one is uh, to, uh, do, to, to not map kernel memory into user space, okay? Some operating systems don't do it, okay? So uh, kind of keep the kernel memory uh, so in, if you don't map the kernel memory, then kind of the whole attack scenario out here uh, uh, is prevented. The only problem is that this, for a variety of reasons, results in significant performance penalty. So that has these. So some of these initial ideas and prevention and all which kind of came out didn't quite work. Long-term solution to really th uh, this is that we should have a hardware level efficient way of undoing micro micro architectural side effects. Okay, when a process is killed, if an exception happens, we should very uh, rapidly be able to undo the lingering changes in the cache and all. So one work which I have seen, what it does is the following. They have the cache and then they also have like a, think of it like a temporary cache. And when you write to the cache, instead of writing to the main cache, you write to this temporary cache. And when you read from a cache, you very rapidly check whether the data actually exists in this site cache, this, uh, okay? And if so, you kind of go there instead of going to the main cache. Mm -hmm. And then you commit from the site cache into the main cache only when the instruction is retired, only when you know for sure. So that's one of the concepts I've seen. Apparently, uh, Intel is implementing it, so maybe at least this kind of attack in future can be addressed using those kind of methods. Okay, let's see. I think I'm gonna stop now because the next one is gonna take me longer than 10 minutes. So I'm gonna uh, pick it up. Uh, if there's time on Thursday, I'm gonna pick it up then, otherwise uh, on Tuesday. Um, uh, regarding Thursday, so one thing to remember is your presentation is 17 minutes. Uh, please make sure you finish 
by then if anything keep it conservative and go a little bit shorter the aim for a little bit shorter than that 15 minutes or so just to keep keep yourself some buffer send uh, put the slide send, send the email me your presentation slides so that i can upload them uh, i would strongly prefer uh, uh, if you send me both powerpoint or keynote or whatever you're using as well as uh, a pdf just so that there are no snacks i would like to project everything from my laptop um, uh, make sure to have them to me by like half an hour before the class because since we are on a tight schedule i don't want to be downloading during the class and um, yeah i think so uh, at 17 minute whatever say um, i have generally noticed that a good way of uh, for a 17 minute presentation you probably shouldn't have more than 10 to 12 slides even okay dep depends obviously on your how busy the slides are and what speed you do it the other thing stylistically so making presentations uh, the idea is not to cut and paste from pieces of the paper and put them on your slide because no one can read it and you yourself will be lost so hopefully you read the paper and then distill it down okay uh, your aim should be uh, be more visual so extract the figures from the paper and just have enough words uh, to act as cues to you while you explain to us right because if the slides have too much stuff we'll be looking at the slides and you will just be reading from the slides if you just read from the slides that doesn't help so your aim should be that slides have few words perhaps some plot graphics and you are explaining that, that to us and uh, you can also like a lot of these papers start out with security is important or iot is important you can kind of skip that because uh, uh, and really get to what the paper is about uh, in terms of the key idea and what their approach is as opposed to spending kind of time on their introduction and all that will eat away from your 17 minutes and kind of it's not terribly valuable so unless you think the paper is doing something which we are just unaware of okay so uh, but just generally like iot is important security is important those things we know we agree let's not waste time on it so so just a few of these things keep in mind because this sub pretty i mean 17 minutes is not that far off from what a typical conference talk is and these papers are all from conferences i mean typically conference talks are anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes maybe 22 minutes so you're kind of in the ballpark anyway so should not be hard reach out to the author for slides um, perfectly absolutely perfectly fine with that okay any questions of, from those you're presenting or about the reviews I would prefer that because that way I can also record it. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So, for presenting, do you want the two reviews? Or do we do both? Oh, okay. If you are presenting, then you only have to do one review and you can pick whichever one it is. And if accidentally I happen to assign to your group, the paper you are presenting, then you must present the other one. I think I took care. I don't think there is any situation where you are presenting a paper and your group is assigned to review that paper. Okay, because that would mean you would just review the paper you are presenting. I don't want that. Uh, hopefully, I'm making myself clear, right? I don't think there is any such case, but just in case. Okay. Okay. So you're going to step.